Hey guys! So today we're going to talk about the second lecture, which is Thinking Critically with Psychological Science. So the purpose of this lecture is really to kind of understand why psychology is a necessary science, uh, why we can't just think about things and understand them, why we actually have to have testable hypotheses and the importance of moving beyond mere intuition and common sense. And we're going to talk a little bit about where that attitude comes from and then how we apply it using the classical scientific method. Uh, lastly, we're just going to address a few frequently asked questions about psychology and try and get rid of any misconceptions that you might have about the field. So the first thing that we have to deal with is this general impression that most people have about psychology. Most people have a very general pop psychology feel with what they think the science actually entails. Uh, so they think of people like radio shrinks or even psychics, people that are you know, looking into the future. But these aren't really what psychology as a field are generally about. Um, so, so they might watch talk shows, people like Dr. Phil, who actually is a psychologist, but uh, he's had a number of problems and he's not widely accepted by the audience of most psychologists as being someone that's good for the field. Um, so we have to kind of run counter to these misconceptions that people have about what our field is because we're still not widely accepted as one of the basic sciences like biology or chemistry because when it comes down to it, psychology is a very, very young field. So a lot of people think, you know, well, why do research? Who cares? A lot of this stuff is just common sense, or this is just things that you can think about and know the answer to. And I, you know, I've, I've dealt with people telling me this the entire time that I've been getting my degree. You know, why are you getting a degree in psychology? There's, there's nothing but common sense. It's all just, you know, shit that you can figure out by thinking. And that's really not true. There's, there's a lot of errors in our common sense. Uh, so one, one of my favorite examples, and this is really more old wives' tale that becomes common sense. Uh, you know, everybody thinks when you shave really close to your hair, it's going to grow back thicker and darker. Well, that's actually not true. That's, that's your perception of the hair, right? So think about a palm tree. When you have a palm tree, and it's really tall, and it waves in the wind, you know, it moves around a lot. Well, what happens if you cut it down at the base? Is it going to respond to the wind? Not really. The same is true of your hair when you cut it down. So when you shave hair, it appears to be coarser and, and more strong because it's got less fluidity to it when you move it. So if you run your hand along the arm hair, you'll see that it actually moves really easily and it feels soft, but gentlemen uh, on your face for your beards, ladies on your legs, if you feel you'll tell that it's kind of coarse feeling, that's not because the hair is actually thicker. It's because it's standing up straighter. Um, so you can do an experiment on this if you'd like and, and, you know, give it a chance to grow your hair out a little bit longer and see if it doesn't soften up a bit. So, you know, beyond just that old wives' tale, let's move back into something psychological in nature because that's very physical. Uh, you know, we have observed limits of intuition like uh, interviewers. They think that they're, uh, you know, dead on when they identify a candidate that they think is going to be a good feel fit for their corporation. They go with their gut feeling. Uh, but the problem with this is that what they're actually doing is they're reflecting on their positive experiences where their gut feeling has matched and they're ignoring all those other instances where they feel like someone's going to be a good fit and then they wind up not being a good fit. So we do this all the time. We try to justify our actions and one of the ways that we do that is by putting a lot of faith into our gut feelings. But oftentimes our gut feelings are just plain wrong. So let's test this out. All right, just take a second, read the question. If you were to fold a piece of paper that's just one tenth of a millimeter thick a hundred times, which we know this is impossible, but let's pretend that you could fold it a hundred times. How thick do you think it would be at its thickest point? Not that thick, right? Wrong. That's how thick it is. 
That's huge. It's unbelievable, but it's true. So, you know, if you were to do a calculation of this, you would find that it's a huge number. Let's try another one. So, let's say that this is physically possible. We get together as a species, and we take a giant, giant-ass rope, and we put it around the equator and join it end-to-end, -end so that it's evenly touching the Earth end-to-end -end around the equator. How much more rope do you think would be added for the rope to be a full foot suspended above the earth all the way around. It's got to be a lot, right? It's got to be a whole lot. Only six feet. Believe it or not, only six feet. And again, you can do this calculation using the uh, commonly found equation for the circumference of, of a, uh, a sphere using pi r squared. Uh, so, you know, or I'm not sure if that's the right equation. I'm going to go ahead and just let the mathematicians follow that one up. But um, but you definitely want to know that our intuition is often wrong. Our common sense is often wrong. So the reason why we have psychology as a field is so that we can counter these questions about common sense with real science where we test out these commonly held beliefs. So one of the biggest errors that we face is the hindsight bias. So we've got this wonderful guy right here, Captain Hindsight. He is the perfect example of the hindsight bias. So we tend to believe, after learning about an income outcome, that we would have foreseen it. Uh, and, and this is because once something happens, it feels like it's inevitable. Once we see the outcome, all the other possible outcomes disappear in our minds. So we should have foreseen 9-11, or you know, we should have foreseen a giant stock crash. But the fact of the matter is that there are hundreds if not thousands of possible outcomes, and for us to zero in on that one and say that that's the definitive outcome is really not feasible. Only once that outcome has occurred do we begin to see the pattern that led to that outcome. So we're all susceptible to the hindsight bias, this whole I knew it all along phenomenon. Uh, and, and you can see it when you're, you're sitting around watching Jeopardy with your parents or something along those lines where, where they say, ah, I knew it, I just had it, right? We're all susceptible to this, so no, no one is immune. Similarly, we feel like we know more than we actually do. So I'm going to ask you guys to, to think about something for a second. How long do you think it would take to unscramble these anagrams? Just go ahead and think of a number in your head and tell me how long you think it would take. Most of you are probably going to guess under a minute. In fact, most people actually guess a few seconds, 20, 30 seconds to unscramble these anagrams. On average, it takes three minutes for people to unscramble these. So I'm going to give you guys just a second, see how long it takes you to figure them out. So what I'd like for you to do is pause the video, try to unscramble them, and see how close you are in your guess and how close you are to the actual amount of time it took you to unscramble them. So everybody's paused the video now. It's time to return. These are the solutions to these anagrams. Something tells me that most of you did not take 20 seconds to figure them out. Most of you probably took a good deal longer. There's nothing wrong with that. It's perfectly normal. So this is the study that it comes from. And it's always a fun thing to test out for yourself. So what we do as a field is we try to figure out how to differentiate between what we think and what the actual conclusions are. So we examine these conclusions and figure out what all of these conclusions mean, how they relate to what we think and what we feel and what we do. And we do this with the scientific attitude. So what the scientific attitude is all about is curiosity, skepticism, and humility. So I'm going to give you an example in a minute of the amazing Randy, and he's a very fun guy. But I want to talk a little bit about curiosity, skepticism, and humility. So 
When I talk about curiosity, I mean asking questions and trying to find those answers. So not just asking, but actually looking for the answers. Skepticism is not about cynicism. Okay, those are two very important different things. We're not saying we don't believe this is possible. We're saying we want to know, and until you give us information for how it happens, we're going to doubt you and continually question you. And that's what the scientific field is all about, is, is doubting and questioning. And then lastly, and this is possibly one of the most important things in, in all sciences, is humility. Because you have to accept when you're wrong. If you don't, you wind up being one of those people that falsifies data and that, that leads to nothing beneficial for the field. So one of the most important things you can do as a researcher is admit when you're wrong. You know, I, I did a, a master's thesis on using video games to uh, reduce the perception of pain. Uh, my, my main hope was using horror video games, you know, scary video games. And um, it didn't work. You know, there are a lot of reasons for that, and I outlined them when I went through my, my weaknesses in the study. But the fact of the matter is that it was important for me to admit that it didn't work so that we don't have other researchers wasting their time on something that's not going to work. So this is the amazing Randy, and he's a big fan of using critical thinking to approach people who have a less than scientific attitude. So instead of blindly accepting something, he actually tested people's abilities. So, you know, I, I don't know if any of you believe in this or not, but we're going to go ahead and use the amazing Randy's wonderful example of people who can see auras. So auras are supposed to be this energy field that emanates from all of us. And, uh, you know, some people's auras have different colors or qualities. I, I don't know a lot about them. But the basic idea is that people have an aura that you can see from a relatively good distance. So the first thing uh, that Amazing Randy does is that he finds people that can see auras. And he confronts them and he says, can you see my aura? Their automatic response is yes. The next question is, well, I have a magazine in my hand. If I put this in front of my face, can you still see my aura? And of course, they reply, absolutely. Of course I can see your aura. So then he says, well, there's this wall over here. If I step behind this wall, could you determine my location based on my aura? Not a single psychic or person that can read auras to date has taken him up on this offer. So this is a perfect example of not blindly accepting it when somebody says at their face, I can do this. You have to test it out because you can't just believe what everybody says. Being scientific means not being gullible. So the scientific attitude is about skeptical but not cynical, open to possibility but not gullible, and humility is key. We must always accept when we're wrong. But it's important to question everything. You know, we, we have um, one, one of my favorite studies that we're going to read about in the future is uh, what's known as the visual cliff. Where, uh, you know, in, in the, uh, I think it was the 60s and 70s, you know, they were trying to figure out when children, babies develop depth perception. And we're going to talk about this in a lot more detail later on, but it's, it's an important example of critical thinking. And so, uh, you know, they were putting babies on this glass table, and they were trying to figure out, you know, once they reach the, uh, the edge, or what's known as the cliff, the glass extends beyond that, but the baby doesn't know. And so how the baby reacts to this cliff determines whether or not they have depth perception. Well, not that long ago, uh, you know, I went to a conference on infant studies in 2004, and, um, 2004? Yeah, two, 2005, actually, I think. Uh, I went to a conference on infant development in 2005, and, um, and, and one of the, the keynote speakers completely tore apart this original assumption we had, that it's actually a phenomenon known as proprioception, not depth perception. Now we're going to get into all of that a lot later, but one of the key reasons I'm mentioning this now is because it's very important for us to constantly question our assumptions about psychology. Because we're a very young field, we're often wrong, and we have to acknowledge the wrongness that we are testing or that we are experimenting with. Because sometimes it's better to acknowledge that you're wrong 
not sometimes, all the times, it's better to acknowledge that you're wrong so that you can move forward as a field. And that's exactly what this man did. He was one of the influential people in the original visual cliff studies. And then he noticed something, went back to test it, realized that he was wrong in his initial assumptions, and corrected the entire field in a really profound and powerful way. So critical thinking is key to psychology. Um, so I'm going to close the critical thinking section with uh, you know, a quote, one of my favorite quotes from Carl Sagan. I, I know how much Reddit loves Carl Sagan, so I, I hope you guys enjoy this. If a god, anything like the traditional sort exists, our curiosity and intelligence are provided by such a god. We would be unappreciative of those gifts if we suppress our passion to explore the universe and ourselves. So that's what psychology is all about, exploring ourselves. And it's really important to use critical thinking to examine our assumptions and assess our conclusions. Uh, so, so one of my favorite examples is, um, you know, medicines. Oftentimes you'll see advertisements for uh, brand name painkillers like Bayer Aspirin, right? And they'll say, there's no better pain medicine, or there's no better aspirin than bare aspirin. That's true. That's 100% true. But it's, it's a lie in a way. Because what they really mean, or, or what's hidden, is the fact that there's no worse aspirin than bare aspirin as well. So by saying there's no better, it implies to you that it's the best aspirin out there. When really, it's equivalent to your generic store brand aspirin as well, because it's the same chemical components. So buy your generics, they're way cheaper, and they work just as well. Using critical thinking, we, we, uh, you know, we use the same scientific method that all other scientists use to try and figure out what it is that's causing any phenomena that we might see. So we construct these theories to organize the data. So we've got all these data points and we try to figure out what they mean. We've got all these facts that we find. And instead of you know, memorizing facts, we fit them together into a framework that fits. And over time, we have questions about some of the assumptions that we have and we revise our initial assumptions and we test them. And then we find new things, and we test those things. And so it's this constant cycle where we learn more and more to give us better insight into you know, whatever phenomenon it is that we're studying. So we start with a the theory, which is an explanation that sort of integrates everything that we see. So uh, you know, a classic example is low self-esteem is a contributing factor to depression. And in fact, this is something that's been studied very, very heavily. You know, the idea that having a low self-opinion leads to, or is at least a contributing factor of feeling depressive symptoms. Now, the hypothesis would be a testable prediction, something that is introduced by the theory, but uh, we can't just accept it without testing it. So. A perfect hypothesis is people with low self-esteem are apt to feel more depressed. Now, what I'd like for you to do is pause the video and take a moment to write down a, or a method of testing this hypothesis. Okay, so now you're back and we figured out um, some sort of method to test this hypothesis. Let's see how well you line up with my method. So what we're going to do is a test where we give people two measures. One, which is a well-validated measure of depression. We're going to use the Beck Depression Inventory. So the Beck Depression Inventory is a depression inventory that's been tested over the years and has been shown to have good validity and reliability, which we're going to talk about next lecture. And um, that information basically means that this scale is a good tool for testing depression. The other thing we're going to give these individuals is a measure of self-esteem. Okay, So we're going to give two scales to our participants. And then we're going to see how well those relate and see whether or not those that score low in self-esteem score high on those depression measures. And if that's the case, 
then that would support our hypothesis. Now, we can't necessarily prove anything. As a general rule, psychology and, and most of the other scientists don't prove things. They show support, they provide evidence, but saying prove means that we're not open to the possibility that we're wrong. So it's always important to never use the word prove unless there is absolutely no benefit of the doubt. And when it comes to things that are psychological, there's almost always a doubt. Without it, we would fail in our development of psychological theories because we have to be constantly open to retesting and honing our measures. So here's a nice little graph that sort of examines what I'm talking about. So it starts with this theory. You know, the low self-esteem feeds the depressive symptoms and makes depression worse. So our hypothesis is that people with low self-esteem are going to score higher on this Beck depression inventory. So what do we do with this hypothesis? Well, we get in the lab and we get a bunch of people together and we give them these self-tests for self-esteem and depression. We see if the low score predicts the high score. So if it's very robust, that's great. But what we want to do then is refine. Let's say that it's not so robust and we don't have the same findings that we really wanted. Well, then we have to really look back at the literature and try and build our theory and alter it in such a way that we have new testable hypotheses. And we go through this process constantly. We're still testing things that we were testing in the 1800s because the fact of the matter is that new information is always available and we have to put this information together in a way that makes sense and grows and builds the field. Uh, so, you know, I, I said we're still doing things that we were doing since the 1800s. One of the earliest psychological studies looks at, uh, you know, race times, which is basically how long it takes someone to complete a race, and whether or not they complete it faster when they're alone or going against another person. That's one of the earliest psychological studies. And we're still testing things that deal with performance and how well you perform when you're alone and when you're with other people, and we're actually going to talk about that later, but here's a, a, a brief example. We find that when something is difficult, you tend to perform better alone than you do when you're, when you're with other people. But if something is easy, then you tend to perform better when you're around other people than you do when you're alone. So, uh, you know, I, I played volleyball in middle school. I hated, absolutely hated, having my parents come to games, in large part because volleyball was a difficult sport for me. I loved it, don't get me wrong, I loved it. But I was playing very competitively with very good teammates and against very good competitors. And it was something that, uh, you know, I'm not super athletic, uh, you know, I struggled on the team and, and for me it was very, very difficult. Having my parents there made me perform worse. Now if it was something like, uh, you know, a spelling test, wouldn't have any impact because I have fine spelling. So that's a perfect example of something that we've been testing using this cycle of research for over a century. And we're going to keep doing it until we get solid theories that really explain a given phenomenon. So one of the things that a lot of people have is questions about psychology. And I'm going to address a couple of those questions. So the first question is, can laboratory experience, experiments really illuminate everyday life? Yes and no. See, laboratories can't replicate the complex world. Part of the reason for this is, is logistics. It, it just isn't practical or even possible to replicate the existing world. But there's another reason and that's that we need to simplify these behaviors so that we can parse out the relationships. So if we're testing, you know, X's impact on Y, if we introduce Z, Q, P, and R as other variables, it could have a lot of confusing impact on the outcome. So we have to control for all those variables. So if we're looking at, uh, you know, performance in the gym, we want to make sure that we're testing people at the same time of day. We want to make sure that we're testing people, uh, you know, in the same temperature. 
all of these things need to be controlled because we need to make the environment something that allows us to find those underlying principles without having to deal with all this extraneous detail. The problem with this is that sometimes it doesn't replicate out into the real world and then we have uh, you know some negative consequences especially when these studies get entered into policy discussions so uh, you know I've, I've done a lot of research on video games and I'm biased I'll go ahead and admit it I'm a huge gamer love video games I think they're fantastic gonna go ahead and lay that out there because I'm gonna talk in a minute about biases and how important it is to acknowledge them so one of the things that they found consistently over time is that playing violent video games results in aggressive behaviors in a laboratory context. So uh, you know what they would do is they would have participants play a, a violent video game, and then they would have them engage in a computer task where they would be uh, tasked with the ability of punishing their opponent. You know, and the way that they punished their opponent was uh, by a loud blast of audio, a loud audio cue, and they were able to uh, adjust two things, the sound level, how loud it was, and the duration. So those two things are something they're able to, to uh, change. And what they found was that the individuals that played the more aggressive video games uh, were more likely to play a louder noise against their opponent for a longer period of time. So the, the conclusion there is that playing violent video games makes you more aggressive. Does that translate to real life? Not necessarily. And in fact, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that it does not. There are a number of people in the video game research field that would say that it does, and they've performed meta-analyses, which are uh, a meta-analysis is when you combine many studies together and, and do a single analysis on all of the data. Um, and, and they've conducted meta-analyses that show that this is, is a legitimate finding. But other researchers have found that it's not, and I'm in fact one of those researchers. We recently did a study where we uh, had individuals play aggressive video games, and we gauged their interactions with a peer. So this was the first study that's ever done in a laboratory condition where we had two gamers playing side by side. And we found that in that condition, those individuals did not associate with aggressive terms uh, more readily and they were not aggressive to their counterparts so there's a lot of trouble with just using the laboratory conditions and then trying to extrapolate that out to the real world so this is one of the biggest struggles for the field of psychology is using laboratory experiments to discover phenomenon in the real world and see whether or not they actually work together in, in a cohesive manner and oftentimes they don't. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Next question. What about culture? Does your behavior depend on your culture? Oftentimes, yes. There are a lot of behavioral traits that come down to culture. You know, um, uh, a thumbs up means one thing in one country and means a very different thing in another country. So, you know, culture is a very important thing to examine, and what we find is that certain things are culture dependent. Other things are not. So, example, dyslexia. The brain areas associated with dyslexia are the same no matter what country you're in. But, for instance, I'm working on a study on substance abuse right now. And we're working with uh, colleagues in another country. And what we found is that the people in the other country have vastly different scores on their alcohol measures, that they actually engage in alcohol use behaviors far less than their American counterparts. That's a perfect example of attitudes and behaviors that vary across cultures. So they do, but the underlying processes are often very much the same. What about gender? Gender is one of the most important things in psychological research. Any study that you look at that has both genders will almost always search for gender differences because biology is a very important aspect of psychology and when it comes down to it, gender differences are real and they're an important thing to examine so that we can make sure that we, uh, you know, test interventions that work best for a specific gender and don't work as well for another or so that we can know you know this is something that's really important to men but less important to women as a, a general 
measures. So of course, you know, there are going to be people that run counter to that. But for the most part, we look at trends for women and trends for men, and we find that there are some really significant differences. So here's an example. Uh, communication style is an important thing that we measure when we're looking at gender differences. So, uh, you know, there, there's a video that if I can find it, I'd love to share it with you guys called He Said, She Said. And it's this excellent video where they look at how young male and young female children communicate with one another. So what they do is they, they brought these young children into a room. They were same-sex pairs, so two little boys, two little girls. They bring them into the room and they have two chairs that are facing in the same direction. So the chairs are not facing each other, they're both facing the same wall. And they put the children in the room and they just have them talk. That's all they have them do. They say, go ahead, talk, have fun, just talk about whatever you want to talk about, have a good time. So the boys sat in their chairs and for the most part looked straight ahead and just, you know, sat there and talked to each other. The girls did something very different. They took their chairs and they angled them so that the girls were facing each other. Not full on, but they were facing each other at an angle so that they were in each other's eyesight. So this is a perfect example of a gender difference that's largely innate. I mean, these are very young children. We're talking three, four years old, and they're already engaging in this gender-specific behavior. Another language one, and this might save some of you men and women trouble in your future relationships, is that men tend to speak more with an eye towards fixing problems. That's generally what male communication centers around, is solutions and problems. Women, on the other hand, tend to work on building relationships when they communicate. So, you know, a classic example is, uh, you know, uh, who, who's seen the episode of, of Futurama uh, where Zoidberg uh, you know, he goes through the, uh, the the urge to mate on his planet, and, and he meets that, that female of his species, and he asks her, what, how was her day? And she starts off, well, I woke up, and then I had a piece of toast, and then I did this, and then I did that. So that's a perfect example. When a man comes home, oftentimes the wife will ask, how was your day? And he'll say, fine. Man says the same thing when the wife comes home from work, and she will describe her full day. This is an important gender difference, and one of the things that if you're in a relationship with someone of the opposite gender, it's important to know. Men oftentimes would, would rather talk about how to solve a problem, so, you know, men, if, that's, if that represents what you do and, and a woman is talking to you about a problem, sometimes she doesn't want a solution. Sometimes she just wants someone to listen, so you should keep that in mind. Same with, with the women. You should keep it in mind that sometimes men want solutions. They want to talk to you and try and figure out a way to solve a problem. So, you know, if they ask your opinion, be ready to give it. So, if we study culture, and we study gender, and all this stuff is human, why the hell do we even look at animals? I mean, we've got so much to explore with ourselves. Why look at animals? Well, animal research is very important. Um, some things are too complex in humans, so if we look at other species that are lower down on the evolutionary chain, like if we look at uh, neural learning patterns, we can look at a slug for that. And if we look at a slug, first of all, we don't have to subject a human to testing, but on top of that, and perhaps more importantly, we can filter out a lot of those extraneous details that I was talking about earlier. Um, and that's very important to, to sort of get at the core of why something happens. In addition to that, you know, there are a lot of people who are against animal testing, and I get that, I do. Um, but one of the real benefits about animal testing is that it gives us insight into something that we might not be able to ever perform with humans because of a lot of restrictions on that. You know, we can't cut open brains like we can with rats. You know, we can't sacrifice human beings to look at their brains, but we can sacrifice rats to look at their brains. We do so in a very humane way, but we do it because it gives us valuable information that makes not only human lives better, but other animals as well. 
So if we didn't do research on animals, we would never have developed a way to treat diabetes with insulin. We would have never been able to uh, do some of the great work that we've done on skin cell repair or, uh, you know, even working with stem cells. You know, th there are a lot of valuable things that we would have never learned had we not experimented with animals. So I, I mentioned in last lecture that I have a a friend from grad school that works in a rat lab and, and you know she cuts open rat brains pretty much on a regular basis. She does audiology research which is the the study of how you hear things and it's a very important field and a lot of what she's going to be working on is going to be helping people who cannot hear helping understand why they can't hear and what can be done to change that so that's a very valuable research field that if we never did experiments on animals we would never be able to even broach the topic. So in answer to the next question, is it ethical to experiment on animals? I believe the answer is yes. We have to, when we do experiments on animals, go through an ethics committee. Uh, just like research with humans, humans have what's known as the IRB, and animal researchers have what's known as the IACUC. And these two research ethical committees look at what you're doing and make sure that you're not violating any commonly held ethical guidelines so you're not needlessly harming the animals you know when when my friend puts rats down you know she, she does what's known as perfusing the rats uh, when, when she euthanizes them she does so in a manner that ensures that they don't feel any pain so this is a very important component. A lot of the animal research has actually improved the lives of animals. So there was a, a really great study where they were looking at uh, stress behaviors in animals that were being held in shelters. And a lot of the research that they did, it was behavioral in nature, a lot of the research that they did with these dogs led to a change in how they treat animals in shelters so that they're no longer stressed out and they integrate better into the home which minimizes their chances of being brought back to the shelter by an owner that's unable to handle them. So we have to be cautious when we experiment on animals, but that's why we have these ethical boards to examine that, because we need someone with an outside eye to make sure that we're not violating the rights and the welfare of animals. Lastly, what about people? Is it ethical to experiment on people? Absolutely. Uh, you know, we, we do experiments every day on people, in, in large part because people can consent to those experiments. So we ask people if they want to participate, and we never force them. It's important that we don't do any physical or psychological harm. We're going to examine some studies in the future that have violated these tenets and, and have led, in large part, to the development of stricter IRB requirements. Uh, but we want to make sure that we only cause potential harm if we have provided the, the participant with the information of the potential harm. So if it's something, uh, you know, like if we're working with rape victims and we might possibly cause them psychological distress by discussing rape with them, the first thing that we do is we give them what's known as an informed consent. We let them know the nature of the study and we tell them the risks and we allow them to make a decision as to whether or not they participate. One of the big things that we have to worry about, though, with experimenting on people is looking at vulnerable populations. The two most vulnerable populations that we have to watch out with are children and prisoners. So uh, I'll talk about prisoners first. With prisoners, they're a captive audience. You know, they're being held in a cell. And so we have to be very cautious. And for that reason, research with prisoners is very rarely done. Um, you know, because we don't want them to perceive this research participation as some way of getting them out of prison earlier. We have no control over that, but they might interpret it that way. So we have to be very cautious when doing research with prisoners, and if possible, avoid the vulnerable um, population. With children, same thing. They are often not fully able to think for themselves. They have more of a, a risk of coercion, of feeling like they're being told to participate. So one of the ways that we counter with that is we get two forms of consent for child studies. We do both informed consent, but we don't get the child to do the informed consent. 
the informed consent goes to the parent. And the parent reads over the study and we leave it up to the parent to make a decision as to whether or not they permit their child to participate. If they do, the next step is to get what's known as child assent. So a child can't consent because they're not legally of age, but they can assent, which means that they give their permission to participate. So in this way, we kind of try to make sure that we avoid some of the risks of dealing with vulnerable populations by covering all of our bases and doing our best to minimize physical and psychological harm. So when you go to that IRB board, if they say, you know, this is something that could be done in a different way, we don't like the way you're doing it, you're going to have to change it. One of the biggest things that they have people change is deception. If you can do a research study without deception, you darn well should. And that's one of the key components of exercising or experimenting on people. No deception, no harm. Last question is, are we free of value judgments? Absolutely not. One of the most important things, we study psychology, you know, this is our field. So we know that everybody comes into life with me-colored glasses. What I mean by that is we all see our lives, we all see the world through our own experiences. So I mentioned video games earlier. I love video games. As a result of that, I have to be aware of my biases when I do video game research because I don't want to allow my preferences for video games to cloud my experiences in the, in the video game research field. So one of the ways that we counter against these biases is not only acknowledging them, but also by having operational definitions. So an operational definition is a definition that is set out from the beginning before doing the experiment that is as clear as possible. So with the depression example from the beginning of the lecture, the operational definition for depression for that study would be the depression score from the Beck Depression Inventory. By using operational definitions, we open ourselves up to replication research. Replication research is a large part of the field of psychology because it's what enables us to confirm earlier hypotheses. So if I did that study uh, with depression earlier, and another researcher comes along and looks at my study, he should be able to tell from all of the things that I've written exactly how I did the study. He should be able to bring that study to another environment and test it with new subjects. And if he gets the same results, then that builds to the field as a whole and it helps to get rid of the risk of value judgments because if we have multiple people having different sets of values but still having the same results, then we know that it's less likely to be the result of someone's values or someone's belief system. So I'm going to close with this delightful little picture right here. What do you see? I'm going to guess that you guys all see a bunny rabbit. That's going to be my guess. Now, it's a duck. You can still see the bunny rabbit, though. It's really hard to ignore. You see that bunny rabbit, and any time you look at this picture, you'll see the duck. But more than likely, you'll see that bunny rabbit, too, because it fits now into your judgment. It's part of what you think of this picture now, and it's going to impact you the next time you see this picture. So that's it. That's the end of the lecture today. So we've talked a little bit about you know, why we have to do psychology as a scientific field instead of a philosophical one. We've talked a little bit about the scientific attitude and the three steps to the scientific method, which of course is having a theory, creating a hypothesis, and testing that theory, and then using the information from the test to come back around to that theory and revise it as necessary. And then after that, we did a little bit of discussion on you know, some, some frequently asked questions about psychology as a field, and I hope that you guys enjoyed the lecture. Feel free to pop back on over to Reddit and ask me any questions. I'll be happy to answer anything that you want to know. And I thank you so much for listening. Have an excellent day.